Yeah, yeah, we're good. We're good. So I have a confession to make. Um, Robert was going. We booked, of course, with Wentworth before you guys came into the picture, and this was just going to be like a little bamboo course, right? And the next thing I know, I was informed. I was informed that uh, there was a bamboo course happening, and I was running it um, by my wonderful father. Um, and I got these erratic phone calls at 8 a.m. 8 p.m. from Neil, you know, kind of blurting off these things about this thing I'd never heard of called the AA. Um, and the next thing I knew, I was like, crap, I already have a bamboo course running that week. Like, what am I going to do? Um, and I tried to cancel with Robert because I was like, how are we going to do well, we two at the same time? Um, Robert was not amused uh, <laughs> that I was trying to cancel the course. Um, and luckily, he sent me a paper, and I'd read the paper, and I really, really liked the paper um, about uh, bamboo. About it was, it was about traditional building and colonialism, I believe. Yeah, and that's this. And, and, so, and so he did, uh, he talked about um, how do the Dutch had influenced uh, the don't traditional give away, building. Don't give away my punchline. Um, that's not a punchline. But then he, uh, but then he got into how green school fits in that whole conversation. That was really interesting. So uh, we decided, kind of, with our, like, you know, feet, seat belts fastened, to run both courses at the same time. Which is like everybody was like, "You're crazy. We're not doing that." Um, except for Maria. Maria was like, Maria was like, "We can't cancel on him." Maria. Maria. Thank and I'm like, you. "It's too much." Woo! -hoo! Woo! And I'm really sorry that we came and ruined everything. No. Uh, you uh, showers a bit, the water. <laughs> that was no, the that's pump not you, actually. Yeah. That's the pump. That you don't get to take credit for that. We, uh, it turns out we haven't serviced our pump for two years, which was the problem. Um, now it's serviced, but the electricity uh, is... We're kind of busting at the seams. We've never had 70 people over there and over 40 here doing a construction site at the same time. Um, so we're, we're learning... So I'm not going to talk anymore, but um, the point is Robert's here, and it's really awesome. He gets a chance to share everything with the AA group, um, and we now know we can run two courses at once. Uh, and and it's better than... And it's better than one courses. We can get 35 people engaged all at the same time. Um, Actually, I was thinking we need more people. We need more people, yeah. We'll turn into a building festival. Yeah. Um, it's like Burning Man without the fire. It's burning. Uh, it's, it's, yeah, it's true. We let's, got the fire. Let's, let's not fire. have anything burn. Um, <laughs> just man. Okay, so I'm going to hand it over to Robert. So welcome, and thank you so much for giving thank us Thank you. Well, I don't know if you guys can tell how much fun we're having and how much fun I'm having. We can tell. Can you tell? <laughs> so, as I said in my introduction, this is a dream come true. Um, and I realized shortly, a little time ago, that today is the 19th, right? 20th. Okay. The 19th was the 25th anniversary yesterday of when I first arrived in Indonesia for the first time. My first time, my first real trip out of U.S. safety zone. Uh, I arrived. It's not and, safe. There, what are you talking about? That's true. <laughs> mentally, it was mentally safe. Mentally stifling, it turned out. Um, but the, uh, and then I stayed for four years and um, don't regret any of it. And uh, so it feels um, really great to be here giving you this. This is uh, a, sh a sharply abbreviated version of this scholarly thing I published. Actually, can I, can I put it on the USB? Yes, please. It's uh, coming out as a book chapter, I think in January. Um, so um, I didn't just write it to ingratiate myself to green school. It's like, look, I wrote you into the history story. Let us come. <laughs> I, it was, it was, I wasn't anticipating any of that. It was, it, I mean this stuff. So, um, so I've given this talk a couple times. I give it, they and I give it at RISD, Rhode Island School of Design, that does a lot of bamboo, and they love this lecture, and they always invite me back. They say, "Do that again." And um, so uh, it starts on September twenty eighth, nineteen twenty three, in Bandung, Java, 
and it looked something like this uh, in this building. And these two architects, uh, at a point when it was Indonesia was still called the Dutch East Indies. It was part of the Netherlands. It was Southern Netherlands. And it was assumed by many, many Dutch people that this was going to be forever a piece of the Netherlands, the much bigger piece of the Netherlands. And I've met people who grew up and went to school, and on the wall of the classroom, there was a map of uh, what we call the Netherlands. And then uh, the rest of the map showed Indonesia. And this was the North Netherlands and the South Netherlands. And it was a country. And it included the, uh, all this. It was part of the Netherlands. Um, and at, that, at this time, the, uh, the very, very dark, openly dirty days of colonial enslavement and oppression and famine and death and destruction uh, was documented, understood popular culture. There was a novel written in the late 19th century called Max Havelaar. How many people have heard of Max Havelaar? It's been called the most important book of uh, the second millennium. So between 1000 and 2000, the New York Times did, uh, named this book the most important book of the second millennium because it ended colonialism. Um, well, that's the claim. You know, if you haven't heard of it, maybe it's not the most important book ever um, uh, in the second millennium. Yes? What's the most important book of the first millennium? <laughs> uh, the Bible, of course, or the Quran, or I don't know, because that's when they wrote it down. Um, uh, so, the, the, uh, so the architects were in this debate. And in the context of what was called the ethical policy, the Dutch government had said, listen, we got to flip things around. We got to do right by our Dutch citizens here in, in the Dutch East Indies. So let's stop enslaving them. Let's give them an education. Let's start building infrastructure. Let's start doing things that dignify and elevate them. And let's marry the two cultures. And so... There was no debate about this between these two architects. The other thing that everybody who came, you know, everybody on the two guys on stage, and they were guys, and everyone in the audience uh, all agreed that architecture was a powerful tool for social transformation. There was no debate about that. If you wanted to uh, engineer a social marriage between Dutch and Indonesian cultures, uh, you do it in part through architecture, some people believed you do it, uh, the, the leading, the easiest, the first thing you do is you create an architecture that brings the cultures together. And so the two guys, uh, so here's, here's the two points of view. The first guy is Schumacher. He said uh, the first great colonial power of the Dutch East Indies was India. They colonized the Dutch East Indies. They didn't. But they thought they did. And the Dutch, we are the second great colonizer of these islands. So uh, the architecture that is worth carrying forward into the 20th century is Indian. And so they said, and the proof of that is in the, the beautiful form of Borobudur and Prambanan in central Java, these huge stone monuments. And he used uh, the pseudoscientific study of phrenology. You can tell if someone's a criminal or not by the shape of their skull. It was very popular in the 1920s. And he used that argument that the truly great civilizations, you can tell by the shape of their profile that they are truly great civilizations. OK, that's Schumacher. Um, Pont, the other guy, the other architect, said, OK, Borobudur, yes, but don't just look at Borobudur, the huge monument. Look at the artwork of Borobudur. In the artwork of Borobudur, you have uh, dozens of different uh, pavilion-type structures that are not made out of stone. The wood architecture and the organic material architecture is what is at, at the core of the greatness of the Dutch East Indies, um, the, the culture of the archipelago, the cult, multiple cultures, the cultural richness that deserves to be married 
to the Dutch. And I don't know if you know Indonesian popular cultural enough to know that if you have a mixed race child, uh, the Indonesians will just assume they're going to be a movie star because they're so damn beautiful. It, you know, it's just killer. And so that uh, was the obvious evidence that the great marriage would be between uh, Indonesian cultures at that time and the Dutch to make beautiful children and beautiful architecture. And, and, um, and so then Schumacher's architecture uh, in Bandung uh, around in the same decade as the debates, he said, we need to bring modern architecture, these modern concrete buildings, and marry them with great civilizations like Indian civilizations. In this case, he chose Mayan great civilizations for the Dutch East Indies. A little weird, but he's trying to marry two great civilizations together. A Mayan, Indian, whatever. Right? It doesn't have to have anything to do with Southeast Asia. And Pont was saying no. He, so he took these, you, you recognize these tiered roofs from the temples in the neighborhood. This is the Hindu uh, Balinese, Hindu Javanese, Majapai, um, multiple tier roofs. In the Dutch capital building, they were planning on moving the capital of the Dutch East Indies from, Jakar from Batavia, Jakarta, to Bandung. And this was the capital building. And then his most famous building ever is the uh, Institute of Tech the Bandung Institute of Technology uh, that marries multiple different Indonesian architectural styles without favoring the Javanese or favoring the Balinese. Um, slight favoritism to the Minangkabau, which you can see here. Um, and bring those forms together into a new hybrid form. And he uses a, a Dutch engineering structural system, which is very stiff and rigid and rectilinear. Um, and you can still see it inside the ITB um, halls. So this stiff uh, Dutch heavy timber with uh, wrought iron brackets and, and connectors um, to create, but, but supporting this, um, this exterior form. And one thing that's important to notice here that will come up later is that these are all straight lines that then they just make more very rigid things and they stick it up to get these pointy bits. And so this is kind of, we need pointy bits. So we use the stiff rafters and parallel rafters and make pointy bits. And um, whereas the, the originals are, are not stiff pointy bits, they are swooping gloriously, um, I don't have to say more to this crowd, um, and Pont uh, left the stage um, kind of feeling um, chagrined because Schumacher made the point, if the Indonesian, and I'm going to say Indonesians, but what he really meant was the Javanese, the Balinese, there was no such thing as Indonesia. There was no such thing, and there kind of is no such thing, except the language of Indonesia is starting to form a culture. But to call to say the word Indonesian culture, it kind of sticks in my throat because it's really four to eight hundred different distinct cultures. So um, I'm going to now say Indonesian culture, but you know what I mean. Um, Schumacher was ridiculing these architectural forms. He was saying, "Look, they don't even know. They don't even know how structure works." And I need a flat bamboo stick. <coughs> I didn't think it would be so hard. <laughs> a split. Okay. I know you're going to Yeah. So, you'd say, you'd say, I need a flat stick. You know, so it's that moment of inertia thing. So this will, this will work. You pull it out of that model right there. Yeah. You need a rectangle. Yeah, it needs to be a, a, a dramatic rectangle. I can do this. This, this is fine one. <laughs> I'll just wash my hands later. So he said, he said, they don't even know how structure works. Their rafters are like this. They're T-doored. They're sleeping. 
there's sleeping raptors. And everyone knows that sleeping raptors are worth a tiny fraction of what standing raptors are worth. And you know, this is the right way to do it. Look at that strength. You aren't gonna, it's not gonna budge. But this is, they, they, they don't know what they're doing. And, um, and Pont didn't know how to answer that. And by the way, Pont was still faking it. He was still faking the swoopy pointy bits. Okay, so Pont kind of lost for the moment. Um, and then he went off uh, to do the business of architects in the colonial service. He did what all architects in the colonial service did. He toured all the islands, including Bali, and he convinced village after village that bamboo is dirty, bamboo is the source of uh, rats and insects, bamboo is for poor people. And he did such a good job that it's still true today. You know, the colonial project was to eliminate longhouses because, you know, you can't have men and women mixing. You need nuclear family houses. And they did, they did a very effective job of that. And to eliminate thatch roofs and bamboo. All these things are nasty. And uh, if you want to be modern and uh, sophisticated, you have to just cut it out. It's for pigs and temporary structures. Um, and so he toured throughout uh, the archipelago. And in the process, he encountered all this stuff that kind of sent his head reeling. And he came back three years later. So here's, here's some models of all that stuff. So one version of it is just that picture. But I was happy to discover in 20... 12, when I visited uh, Bali, all these models of the traditional architectural forms with swooping bamboo, and plus all this new wackadoodle stuff that you guys are doing here. Um, and this is, uh, these are a collection of models that are on the ceiling. Is it still there? Yeah. Okay. We didn't get to go in there. This is in the Peite Bamboo uh, main office where the bamboo factory is. So, I'm flying, I'm flying, I'm just stepping gingerly over the models, or I'm walking underneath it with my camera upside down. You decide. So, um, he came back and he said, Oh my God, now I get it. All these buildings everywhere they're all based on bamboo even if they're made out of wood there's still you know there's this bamboo thing that started it and all of these things it's it's not decadence it's not ignorance it's not lack of understanding of how structures work it's deliberately taking advantage of the the weakness, the, the bendability of these elements. It's either a, a stick of bamboo that bounces, or it's uh, once you get rid of all the bamboo, you still need the bouncy bit. And so you got you can't do this. By the way, this is offensive to God to be so stand-uppish. You, you need to bow down before God. So that's, that's how the priests explain it. Um, the Dutch explain it is, uh, well, this is European and this is stupid. And, uh, but Pont said, no, it's supposed to bend. It's actually, the structure is actually lifting towards the heavens. And that's part of uh, the function of these structures is they're not just stiff, you know, orthogonal, rectilinear, dead things. They actually lift towards heaven. The, the forces are the forces are upward. There's some forces downward, but it translates into upward forces. And um, it's not stupid. It's brilliant. And so he came away with a new appreciation. He produced this analysis of uh, all these different, mostly Javanese structures that he was now analyzing as tensile structures. So this gets back to Alora's talk and how Friado comes up. 
is that there's a tensile structure magical thing going on here with all of these buildings. And I was really thrilled to find this analysis, this diagram of all these, all these engineers. I was like, okay, I want to find all these buildings and see how they work. And I said, oh, that's cool. I know this building because I spent weeks and weeks trying to figure this joint out. It just happened to be, coincidentally, um, the place where I was doing a lot of my research. And I was trying to figure out what's up with this. Why is the bottom of the rafter not, uh, why is this lower roof hanging off the eave? Why isn't it to this, there's this incredibly heavy set of beams way over the top. You don't need it structurally. You know, I was tempted to think, they don't know what they're doing. This is way over structured. And then they don't even use that to hold up the bottom roof. They hang the bottom roof off the eaves of the top roof. Crazy. And it's so, but what I realized, it's like a fulcrum. It's, it's like a lever. And so the bottom roof is hanging off the eaves of the top roof. And these are pins that connect this lower roof to the top roof. And so if the point of fulcrum is here, this lower roof pushes down and thrusts the upper roof towards heaven. And the only thing that keeps it from flying too far up into heaven is it's tied by this ridge beam. If the ridge beam gave way, it would fail like this. The, the rafters would actually fall upward. So, because it's this scissors, teeter-totter, seesaw thing going on. And it was like, wow, thank you, Pont. Because this is me trying to figure out this stuff. <laughs> I'm, I'm not that. I'm not. <laughs> I think I have the same pants. I'm not, but, it's, but it's this building, and I'm crawling around in this little fulcrum point, trying to figure it out. I actually was doing cast, paper mache castings. I, I, I don't know. So, um, and in the process of doing this work, because I, uh, when I arrived here 25 years ago, I went off and started uh, doing research uh, at the palace in Solo, Central Java, and I became uh, uh, kind of a support, I formed a support team, and we uh, applied for grants. The palace was falling apart. The government wasn't uh, supporting it financially and um, and so I was I, we actually got uh, money for the reconstruction of significant parts of the palace and this is um, the main guy he's not just the worker he's also a priest so he's a master builder architect priest using hand tools to chop this sacred column he's wearing this which all of us were wearing because this is the sign to the Queen of the South Seas that you're a friend of the king's, and so she doesn't uh, you know, cause an accident. You don't come to any harm. You're not an enemy of the palace. Before you enter the palace, you've got to put this on or else you're taking big chances. If you've been in Bali a while, I don't need to explain that much more. And he explained to me that, um, and here's all this timber, and some of them do come and rest right on here, but some of the one I was showing you is the fulcrum. So they don't all do that. Every single name that is used for every single joint has two meanings. One, it's it's a mortise and tenon joint, and it, it's treated like we treat mortise and tenon. Mortise and tenon is just a technical name. It means the male thing sticks into the female thing, and it makes a stronger joint, mortise and tenon. Get over it. It's, that's all there is to it. But in the Javanese practice and the Balinese practice, it's never just a technical term. It is simultaneously a technical functional term and a religious philosophical. It means that without the union of the male and the female, all life you know, ends. And so it's a, it's a joint and it's a uh, life philosophy. And it's true. And the name... Uh, isn't mortise and tenon that has no other meaning other than mortise and tenon. It, every one of these terms has multiple other meanings that are both technical and philosophical and religious. And so you need 
a master builder priest to do this stuff because it's not just, is it going to break? Is it going to fall down? It's also at the same time, is it going to cause disorder on earth? Is it going to cause a blockage of the flow of good fortune from the heavens to the earth and outward? Because the palace was an instrument of controlling the balance of heaven and earth, like a lot of the temples around here. You use the temple like the one uh, we walked through on Champuan Ridge. When something's going wrong in the world, it's the job of the priests of that Champuan temple to restore the balance of heaven and earth. And um, over in Java, it's the job of the king to use the palace as an instrument, give offerings here, give offerings there, depending on what goes wrong, uh, to restore the balance of heaven and earth. So it's, it's a building, yes, but it's also a tool. It's an instrument for, for uh, cosmic change and cosmic balance. And so here's the same guy um, at a ceremony in a more priestly garb. And um, this is, will be familiar if you understand Balinese practices. And I've been talking a lot with um, Pat Moko about this. His father was a, I mean, his grandfather was a Nundagi, which is the uh, Balinese word for the master builder priest that every village was required to have at a certain time um, that, to make sure that the buildings get built in a certain way. And I'm not going to go into the fascinating minutia of all that, but it's huge. Um, and it has to do with you every, every dimension and every measurement in the buildings uh, and in the household uh, three by three grid complex is based on the dimensions of the, uh, the owner of the house. And so you have the khaki, the foot, you have the span, uh, you have this, the fingers are crucial for all of this. And still, I see Pat Moko saying, you know, two fingers, this is, you know, that's seven centimeters, here's 14. So it's still, there's still remnants of that in, in what's happening even on site here, a few meters away. Um, so Pont uh, made this theory and put it out there. It didn't really go anywhere, but it transformed his trajectory. After doing these huge projects uh, at a fairly young age, he kind of disappeared off the map and into his complex. He, he was married to a Javanese woman, and he started to play with these cable, uh, these cable roofs that this ridge beam was a stick down to here, and this was a stick down to here. And when the wind blew, it would kind of go like this. And instead of uh, putting the clay tiles on sticks, he put the clay tiles on cables. And the whole thing flexes in the wind and in earthquakes. And so he became obsessed with this dynamic motion uh, of the, the, um, the architectures of Java and Bali and elsewhere. And it's still there. It survives everything. Um, uh, and it's, it's just a... a an, a really remarkable thing that uh, is not very much heard of. And it was interesting to, to visit in 2012, talk to John um, uh, and some of the guys at uh, Pete Bambu about what they're doing. And um, the similarities are striking. You know, it's um, that the, that this whole thing um, that's going on here uh, I get the impression that John and Cynthia and everybody thinks, oh, yeah, we wanted this great school. Uh, it had to be innovative. We called in the architects. They gave us boxes, and we said, get out, and we decided we could do it better ourselves. And um, boy, were you right. Thank you for doing that. I, I don't often thank people for firing the architect, um, <laughs> but I'm so grateful that you fired the architect and did it yourself. Um, but in a way, and this is the final point, so much of what is going on here is, uh, is uh, reminiscent. It, 
it's kind of like what we were talking about at dinner. If there were no teachers, people would still learn. Even without making any connection to the long history of bamboo stuff that moves and is alive and is curvy and, and uh, just amazing, it, it, you know, it happens again. Um, so that's, that's the talk. So I hope there's questions and discussion. Thank you. How long was that? How long was that? I don't know. How long was that? Check the recording. It was like half an hour. Okay. What? Okay. It's much longer than I was aiming for. Half an hour. Thank you. He's telling me what I want to hear. Thank you. I really appreciate that. What does it say? We started late. Twenty-three minutes. Yes. <laughs> so is, uh, or would, would you say Ibuku's work is influenced by, or maybe even building on top of Hans' work? Like, is there a, is there a connection? Well, I a think connection. I think this is no. the connection. They've just done the same studies. Well, I don't. I don't really get this, and so I mean, I want to answer the question with a question. What's up with this? I mean, I look at these models, and some of them are like, you know, this is an extension of the amazing jewelry design. Uh, but then there's this, uh, there's all these traditional, you know, there's this one over here. You know, what's what's up with this? What's going on here? What's what's your? So my dad, my dad has a very strong affinity with culture. In Indonesia, no uh, he, he, uh, he, he is very influenced by culture, but he's, and I mean, the, he's very much marrying his creative innovation with the cultural capacities he encounters. Mm -hmm. and he did that with jewelry, um, and he even did that with handicraft. Uh, there's a story about my dad, the first time he realized he had a good idea <coughs> He, um, he found a frog in the, on the handicraft road in Tagalog in the early 80s. And he, he had the idea of, of giving the, the frog a taro leaf. You know those, part, those big heart teeth leaves that you can use umbrellas? Um, a, a taro leaf. He had the idea of giving the frog a taro leaf as his umbrella. And he made a, he made a 50 of them. Um, and then he he went to Canada to sell 50 of them. I don't know how many there were exactly, but there was a bunch. And he came back six months later, and there was this frog with a banana leaf on every street corner <laughs> along that whole handicraft road. Everybody was making a frog with a banana leaf. Um, <laughs> because someone saw the frog with a banana leaf and paste plates a big order got rich, the whole village decided that that must be the thing that's selling. Um, so they all started making it. <laughs> and has that been produced now in Mexico? Probably. I don't know. Uh, but there's still the frog, but there's no banana leaf. There's no, uh, there's no taro leaf anymore. It's just, uh, it's just a little umbrella. But this, you know, so I think that, you know, the, um, the, building is the teacher and your dad is listening to the voice of the building so he's fascinated by these things and he's you know and it's still going on I mean your dad didn't build this this was built more recently right uh, yeah well my dad was very involved in that process okay um, that's so my point with the frog with the banana leaf is just that you know he he kind of found a, a little niche and took a traditional frog and added an umbrella, right? Mm -hmm. And that was like, that was all it took. And that was something that people thought was interesting. Um, and he built all the jewelry based on, he took a, an Italian chain and, and squashed it and added uh, a Balinese craftsman to it. And all of a sudden you had this thing that no one had ever seen before. 
And it was just a compilation of some things he had found, and, and then he squashed it, right? Like mm -hmm. Into an oval rather than a, a circle. Uh, and, and it felt better on the wrist, right? So we built a whole business on that feeling, right? Mm -hmm. So, so and then he got out of the jewelry business, and he got into architecture um, and building. And it started with the pen jar. Does everybody know the pen jar? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, it's the bamboo pole that... Hangs over. Uh, yeah, putting on right now. You should all know a pen There's like these crazy things going like this everywhere. Mm -hmm. So um, that's bamboo, right? So he got into bamboo from Linda, and he saw the pen drawer, and he went. He found an architect actually. And he told the architect he make the pen drawers neat, and he made the John Hardy showroom with two pen drawers, two pen, two two bamboos coming up, and he joined them together like that, right? So they're crossing like that, and they made a little bit like that. Cathedral uh, that Simone Bell has made, right? But very simple, just like that, and then like probably a triangle there. I don't remember. And that's still the John Hardy showroom. You can go there and see it. Um, and that was the first bamboo building. And then the next one he did was a Minan Kabao building. Right. And he went, well, all the Minan Kabao buildings have bamboo in them, that one, uh, but th there's a lot of wood in them too. So he's like, let's make it just out of bamboo and let's make it out of black bamboo. Because no one's ever built a building out of black bamboo, right? Yeah. Of this size, so so he built these this big Minan Kabao, and that's a bamboo inda, and you'll probably get to see that too. And then he got kind of into it, um, and then he said, "Let's start a school," um, and that's when he got the the architect, who's the Minan Kabao. She measured the Minan Kabao building with Linda, and she figured out how to do it in bamboo, and then so they started the school, and then that kind of from there, it turned into the bridge, right? That was the first building. Got York to come, York Stam, um, and combined it with the Minan Kabao thing he was into, and that became the bridge. And then from there, it, it, it escalated into you had three mountains, which was the next one, and that turned into Heart of School. So I mean, there's a clear progression that's very yeah. influenced by the culture. So, so it it uh, allows me to say with greater certainty that the building was the teacher. The building was the teacher. And the Sumba house is the most recent version of that, where he went to Sumba and went into the house of the Sumanese and was like, wow, this place is really cool. Um, in Sumba, they build those houses with the central columns. It's very similar to a Joglo, uh -huh. I believe. Yeah. Um, almost all of the culture, not I'm generalizing, a lot of the cultures in Indonesia have it like common threads, and one of them is that you stack things in squares mm -hmm. horizontally um, and vertically uh, you, you put this that there's a spiritual world the human world and then the animal world which is literally represented there where you yeah. have uh, the spiritual world being the top part no one lives up there to the ancestor it's that big hat uh, the taller your hat the more status you have in the village um, then you have the main part which is the and then under the house the house is tall enough to keep you away from the floods but also to keep your animals underneath them um, and he built that at Bambuinda. He said, let's build one entirely out of bamboo, and let's give it the tallest roof we could possibly give it. Mm -hmm. um, so he did that. Uh, and that became a reception for a school in Sumba, right? Mm -hmm. So in Sumba, there's now a Sumba house that's made entirely of bamboo. So it's the only Sumba house in Sumba made entirely of bamboo. And I want to point out that these rafters pass over a fulcrum here and then hang beyond it. So it's the same thing where these things are, this roof is pressing down, and these sticks want to spring outward. So, it, so the, the, the thing that we started with was I'm number four. Um, it's what I, they laugh because I, when I first met them, I said, my name is Robert Cowherd, and I am number four. It might be, you might be confused because you're all sitting out there and I'm standing up here, you're listening and I'm talking, I'm imparting information and you're just empty vessels uh, being filled up with the information. Um, don't be fooled by that. I'm at best the fourth most important source of information uh, for what we're doing here in a school. Uh, and so the question is, what, what's number one? What's number two? What's number three? Number three, the classmates. Number two, 
are the models and drawings and the thinking and the writing of architecture because we learn a lot by looking at the world through these instruments of understanding. We can see the world better because our microscope and telescope are models and drawings. So number two are those microscopes and telescopes that are the models and drawings. Number one is the world itself that we are looking at. And so, uh, in a way, this is the same thing. Pont looked at the Minangkabau house and he said, oh, that's cool, I'm going to copy that. But he didn't understand it. It took Schumacher's taunt about you know, making fun of the Indonesians that don't know shit about structure. And so that taunt, combined with his experience in the colonial service, um, allowed him to hear the voice of what um, these buildings were saying to him. And it's uh, not a total coincidence that probably if you went, if you made this a laundry list and you went through the ceiling of Pete Bambu and this room, you'd probably find every single one of these represented somewhere because John and team said, let's learn, I, I mean, I'm projecting now, let's learn what can be learned from what these houses have to tell us about what is possible, what what can be done. Um, and so, uh, you know, the buildings are the teacher. They taught Pont and they taught, they taught uh, Hardy and company and Pete Bamboo and are still teaching us. Because yeah. you know, here the models sit and they're speaking to us. So this is number one. We're learning from the bamboo. The bamboo is the teacher. So did John Hardy, like, was the teacher like the culture and then it became the bamboo and then the teacher was well the penjor the penjor was the teacher right. the first one he, he said oh look at that penjor and like the curve right. and saw the bamboo and said why don't you do one to an architect he went do it like that oh. make it as tall as you can like that so very it. it's not very complicated yeah but it's brilliant <laughs> exactly <laughs> it's so simple the, the dots and the bamboo The bamboo came in because he was like, wow, I just had, I have an amazing jewelry business that I'm selling, and what am I going to do with myself and this money I made? And he was, current, and I'm serious, right? Like, And, and he watched The Inconvenient Truth. He watched right. Al Gore's movie, and he's like, wow, like, there's some problems going on, and like, what am I going to do about that? Um, and so he, he said, well... I can uh, I can stop using timber because I'm using a lot of that, and that's not good. I think he also had an uncomfortable relationship with formal education. Well, the school thing came later. Let's start one step at a Okay. Um, so <laughs> Thank you. The school thing is a little bit more complicated and not part of this course. Uh, <laughs> but but no, he 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 you know it's very simple. Like he wasn't. He said he said I want you know I'm gonna use bamboo. And he saw Linda using bamboo, and the disagreement he had with Linda Garland um, was Linda Garland was not sold on bamboo as a structural a structural material. She mm -hmm. did not believe you could make structures out of bamboo. Mm -hmm. She believed it was important and we should use it and you can like you know make a great roof and, and add some support, but you should you know you couldn't make a full giant structure out of bamboo. And he went, I'm going to make a giant building out of Structured a bamboo and, and prove you wrong, and they don't speak. They haven't spoken to each other since. Really? <laughs> yeah, they still don't speak to each other. Heartbreak. Because she was the queen of bamboo, and he yeah. kind of usurped her throne. Mm -hmm. um, and not very graciously, I imagine. He, he wants to, you know, he's, he's very brash in what my my father likes to do things the way he likes to do them. Um, and so he just said, let's use it for everything. And when we opened Green School, like, people would come up with very reasonable things. Like, we're going to put a plastic skylight in because, like, we don't want it to disintegrate. And he would not allow it. <laughs> there was no – the floors were dirt. There were dirt floors. No one wanted – like, the people were like, what? You're going to have dirt floors? Like, come on, you've got to compromise somewhere. He's like, no, we're going to make the greenest place you've ever seen. Right? That's That was his 
kind of mode. He's kind of like, I'm going to set the bar here and, and, you know, fight it back to there at the end of the day. And so they ended up putting some cement in the floor <laughs> when he couldn't figure out how to do the mud. Um, and people have done really great mud floors. It's kind of a shame but uh, that we haven't figured that out yet. And he, he, he tried to do, like, latex canvas roofs, but we couldn't find the right canvas. So we, we put in some plastic roofs and you know, he, it's not a perfect world, as he says, but it's kind of like he just was committed to bamboo and he wanted it to be beautiful. So he said, you can't make it out of anything else. No, you're not allowed to have any steel joints. No, you're not allowed to put timber there. No, you're not allowed to put cement anywhere above 40 centimeters above the ground, right? Go figure it out. Um, that's how he did it, right? So give you all the resources you need, but, and, and it has to be really beautiful because no one's gonna come with the ugly. <laughs> And no one's going to really argue with them. It's true. You know, no one's going to come if it was ugly, right? And we see that in the decisions we're making today. If something, you know, when something was uh, cracked, you didn't say, that, that's not structurally sound. Instead, you said, that's ugly. Gillette. Yeah, <laughs> which means bad all around. <laughs> which I thought was great. Is it's not that'll break, that'll fall. No, it's ugly. <laughs> but you'll see, like I'm not an architect, I'm not an engineer. I don't really have any formal training in any of it, right? Mm -hmm. um, but our role, and no, 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 nobody in our family does. Our role isn't really about that, right? Like yeah. there's people to do those things, and we have lots of people around us that can help with that. It's really about okay, it has to be. A certain, there has to be a certain aesthetic, a certain beauty around it. You can't just be like, you're not, you're not allowed to compromise on that. Just, you know. And the engineer is not the teacher. The building is the teacher. When it falls or when it sways or when it moves, then you put another stick in. Yeah. And I, I'm really sorry I didn't catch the Skype call because you found an engineer who's down with that. Like, wow. Well, he gave me a free consultation. I didn't even ask for it. He was like, you got to let me talk to the students. Like, when are you going to let me talk to the students? Uh -huh. like, so he's going at six. Like, we'll move dinner back, uh -huh. um, which is really great. You, you know, Atelier One is, like, kind of up there. Yeah, the they're famous. World. Yeah. Uh, so it was really cool. And, and he, 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 got, he didn't see our model perfectly, so he was going to tell us our whole building was going to collapse. And we're like, excuse me, wait, no, it doesn't go quite like that. It's also, it's not collapsing right no, now. it's not it's collapsing. Up. But when we explained it to him, he mm -hmm. was like, oh, that, that, yeah, that works. So, yeah. Um, it's just great. But, I, I mean, I really love how well this thing that I guess I'm known for now, you know, hi, I'm number four, fits so nicely with our experience here. You're like uh, giving me some credibility. <laughs> so I appreciate that. So it's working pretty well, keeping the world itself as number one and and, and uh, putting those professionals down a few notches. Number four is probably just right. Yeah, I mean, we'll see, eh? It's, it works here. <laughs> But I don't know, like my sister's saying, if you bring that to somewhere else, like... We will punish you. <laughs> uh, well, you know, what, what, uh, yeah, first of all, it's illegal, what are you doing? Yeah. Um, but, uh, but, you know, it, it, it'll be interesting to see where, you know, where it, how it evolves and when the professionals step in and what that looks like. Yeah. Um, because we're, we're not, you know, we make mistakes in our buildings. There's green village houses that have dropped a little bit. They're um, teaching us. They're teaching us, yeah. They're doing what the, they're supposed to do. But the homeowner isn't particularly amused, right? She's amazing, an amazing woman. Um, but she's like, yeah, the building's dropping a little bit. I don't know what we're going to do about that. The building's not dropping. What? The building's not dropping. It's, it dropped a little bit. <laughs> oh, you're so busted. <laughs> Your sister. <laughs> Boom. Hey, Laura. <laughs> <laughs> She told me it was dropping. See, there we go. Define drop. You got me. <laughs> that's my point exactly. I don't know if it's going to work. Do you want to know? Yes. The floor is sagging under the weight of the stone countertops. There you go. It sounds like dropping to me. <laughs> but it's, it's teaching us 
that we need to learn. And, and the reassuring thing is we're learning, you know, we've, we've learned this lesson, you know, next week we'll apply it. Yeah. But I mean, it, it'll be interesting to see when the professionals being number four, right? Mm -hmm. um, where it, you know, where it, uh, as it grows, what happens with that uh, situation? He's like, people like Neil are coming and getting involved and wanting to work with Laura. And that's amazing, right? And, and, and their expertise is going to add a lot. Yeah. But I, you know, I don't know enough about what the building world is like, really. That's mm -hmm. what I kind of see from a distance. Mm -hmm. To know how it's different. Well, James and I were saying, oh, we would fix this, you know, how the kerf cuts are opening up and the ridge beam. Uh -huh. so, oh, that's wrong. You need it. What we need here, and, and like, we had this great conversation about exactly what the right solution is. But it's like, I'm not going to say a word. And I just avoided saying it now. I'm not going to tell you what an engineer or architect would advise you to do. Let's see if it falls. <laughs> An expensive ball. <laughs> yeah, as long as no one gets hurt. I'm trying to convince these students that you're supposed to act, let it, uh, let it fa fail, as soon as possible, because there's going to be multiple iterations, and that's the only way you discover things is you break it multiple times in slightly smaller ways each time, and. You, your curse as architects doing it this way is that you will never not be making a mistake and you'll be always kicking yourself, hey, when am I going to get this right? But when looked at from the outside, the mistakes are getting smaller and smaller and smaller and what we see from the outside is what's defined in our society as brilliance. Yeah. And you don't experience it as brilliance, you experience it as a series of failures. But what glorious, ever-decreasing severity failures they are, and we don't want to screw it up by giving you the answer before you allow that process to follow its course, otherwise there's no discovery. I, I agree with you, but I, I think a Laura sitting back there would like some answers, probably. You know, you know what I mean? Like, if someone could have said that stone countertop should not go there, <laughs> um, I don't even think she built that. Did you build that house, Laura? <laughs> oh, there she is. I mean, were you in here when they built the tower house? Yeah, not when the was So she wasn't there, but like, you know, it's, it's, there's, there's still a lot to learn, right? As, as she's growing. Like, and discovering. But the fact the architect isn't in charge, I think, is interesting. Yeah. Maybe not number four, but not number one. <laughs> so any, anything else? I think that's might be enough. Okay. Let's get some rest. Thank you.